the wrong environment will kill your seed. Remember, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes like a roaring lion seeking those to devour. He wants to uproot the seed that you're planting because the seed that you're planting has potential. And now with today's word, Pastor Tyrone Morrison. I don't know. I'm a little excited this morning. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Let me take a sip. Amen. And I want to continue off a subject that I, I, I was talking about a couple weeks ago as we're relating to our theme this year. How many know we're talking about progress this year? We're talking about progress. We're not going to end this year the same way we ended last year. We're going to make some progress. We're going to put one step in front of the other and have some progress. And that, what that does is creates movement. And then you get momentum because we're making progress. But last time I was with you, we were, we, I began this subject entitled Cultivating a Mindset of Abundance. Cultivating a Mindset of Abundance. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, setting, sitting at the right hand of God. Now, in verse 2, underline this. It says, set your mind on things above. I'm going to say that again. Set your mind on things above. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, set Say that with some conviction. Say, set your mind on things above. And then he says this, not on the things of this earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Amen. Father, we thank you today, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, that your word brings edification and grace to those who hear it today, Father. Thank you that your word is a light unto us and a light unto our path. We thank you, Father, that, that you help me rightly distribute or rightly communicate your word with your people this morning. Thank you, Father, that we come expecting to hear from you. Let it not be of Tyrone. Let it be of you. In Jesus' name, all who agree said, amen. amen and amen. So we were talking about cultivating a mindset of abundance. And today I want to focus on setting your mindset. I said setting your mindset. So a couple weeks ago we were looking at, for, at Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 3. And we see the prophet Jeremiah instruct his pe the people of Israel saying, break up the follow ground. Break up the follow ground. And he says, do not plant amongst thorns. So we were exploring the idea of what it means to cultivate. Because if, you, if you're familiar with agriculture and farming, you know that before you plant the seed, you have to cultivate and break up the ground in order for that ground to be able to receive the new seed. See, a lot of times we, we talk about growth and we're just saying plant the seed. Well, you got to examine the ground that you're planting in. And in cultivating, number one, it means that you're embarking on new territory. So when we're breaking the, up the follow ground, it's territory that's never been cultivated before. This is a new chapter that's in your life. If we want to grow, we have to be willing to expand our territory. We got to expand. We got to be willing to go places where you've never gone before. The Star Trek, the Trekkie in me. 
You got you to gotta go places where you've never gone before. You got to be willing to try new things. You got to learn new information. You have, to, you have to break up the follow ground. But the second meaning for breaking up follow ground is to dig up some old things. So you, you, have, you also have to cultivate land that's been cultivated before but has not been attended to in a while. Because, you know, you can just break up the follow ground, but you, there can be weeds in your garden. If I'm going to plant new seed, I got to dig up the weeds because the weeds choke up the, the potential of that new seed. See, it's the cultivating part that takes work. A lot of times before you even plant the seed, you did a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, plant gardens, you know what I'm talking about, right? You have to dig it up. You have to dig. Sometimes you get rocks in that, in that ground that you, you didn't know was there, but it was a whole big rock that was there. And the, the, the ground would not have been ready to, pers- to, to receive the seed had you not done the work. So we got to cultivate a mindset of abundance. So we got to dig up some old things, some old attitudes, some old processes, some old behaviors in order to plant the new seed that has a potential for new growth. Y'all with me this morning? We have to cultivate that. So we focus on cultivating, but today we're going to focus on setting your mindset. Setting your mindset. So if you think about the word for mindset, it refers to a set of attitudes. An attitude is a fixed mental state of mind. It's your attitude. You want to attract success, you got to have a good attitude. Your attitude will attract or repel based off of your attitude. Some of, some of us need an attitude adjustment. So it's a set of attitudes, beliefs, and ways of thinking that impact how you perceive and respond to situations and challenges. It's the mental lens to which you see the world through. Every one of us has a lens in life. I didn't bring my glasses with me, but I got to prescribe glasses that's just fit for my eyes. It's supposed to help me see better at night. I got a little stigmatism at night when I drive. But I have a lens, but everybody has a lens that you see life through that is set by your mindset. By your mindset. And your mindset is oftentimes set by experiences, by information, by narratives that you have accepted to be the truth for you. You have accepted that truth. Some people cannot see themselves prospering because they have have accepted information that is not the truth. They can't see themselves in healthy relationships. They can't see themselves financially stable. They can't see themselves living in a a better life. They can't see because of the mindset that has been set for them. A lot of how our our mind thinks, actually our subconscious mind thinks, it operates by a lot of the information that's been passed down from generation to generation. See, society at large has had a large part in setting your mindset. I believe, I believe that a lot of the problems that we face today is not just system all the time. It's a mindset problem. It's how you see it. You can blame the system. Now, I'm not saying there is no systemic issue. There's some systemic issues, but you don't have to go by the system. You don't have to go by the system. God didn't even create racism. We created that. And a lot of people still live off of that mindset because they've been sold this mindset that says you can't, you can't make it because of the tone of your skin. <laughs> Am I preaching already this morning? Same thing with people who are affluent or, or, or in poverty because of the mindset that has been set for you. And people that, there's people that are living in a certain tax bracket because you won't change the way that you think. But I'm here to tell you 
that you can change the way that you think. I'm here to tell you this morning that you can set your mindset. You can shift how you think. You can see things differently. You, you can change this here, here and there and change the trajectory of your life based off of your mindset. I like to give illustrations and, you know, as many of you know, I'm part-time in sales and I do a lot of, you know, technology and stuff like that. And we all are like a type of computer. Picture a computer in your mind, right? A computer has its hardware and it has its software, right? The hardware, it has a monitor, it has, you know, some type of screen, it has the chips that's inside, that's the hardware. But then it operates off the software. And the software needs to be updated from time to time. And when you're updating the software, it's based on how it will function for you, right? When you go and do this update, it's you, you, especially when you get a new computer, it's going to say, do you like this? Do you like that? How is this? Because it's catering for you. But see, we have to update the software because things change all the time around you. Nothing in life stays the same. Even though we may like our, our phone until it dies. How many know that even though you like it, your banking system may not like it? How, how you know, you may not like it, but the other things that, that, that are working with you may update their system, which means you have to update your system. You have to reset your mindset. I see people all the time, I didn't like when they make it change. It makes me change everything. Well, you better learn how to adapt to change. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It is going to happen. And that's whether we protest it or like it or not. It is going to happen. So I have to change my attitude and change my mindset. But see, there's two different types of mindset. There's one is a fixed mindset. And then there's a growth mindset. A fixed mindset is a mindset where an individual believes their qualities, such as intelligence and talents, are static. And it cannot be significantly developed. They think it is the way that it is. It just is what it is. I'm comfortable with how it is. I liked it how it used to be back in the day. <laughs> and they don't want to change. They don't want to learn. They can't expand and they can't grow. They perceive effort as fruitless. And if, if success is not immediate, therefore avoid, they avoid challenges out of the fear of failure. And here's the thing, they view feedback as a personal attack. Feedback's one of the best things that you can have. Please tell me where I messed up. I wanna know how I can be better next time. So that's a fixed mindset, but a growth mindset is a mindset that's characterized by the belief that abilities and intelligence can be developed through dedication, effort, and learning from experiences. These kinds of people embrace challenges. I get excited when I see a challenge. A challenge may, 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 may cause me to be uncomfortable, but you know what? That's the potential waiting on the inside of you to get out and grow. You can't grow without resistance, without being uncomfortable for a If you're comfortable, something's wrong. Com that comfort can be just stagnant and stifle your potential and your growth. You're not meant to be comfortable just with how life is. I'm just satisfied. That's a dangerous place to be. They're just comfortable. But with a growth mindset, you embrace the challenge. You persist through obstacles because you see this as an opportunity to grow. I see this as an opportunity for me to get better. 
as I always say, we should be better today than we were yesterday. You should be looking for opportunities to get better today than you were yesterday. So you see obstacles and you embrace challenges, you persist through obstacles. You see effort as a path to mastery and then you view criticism as an opportunity for growth. You can learn from somebody criticizing you. Their, their attitude may not always be right, but you can still get something out of that and say, you know what, yeah, I could be a little bit better here. What, what else can I change so that I could be more effective in how I communicate or how I can do my job better? You gotta always have a, an attitude that's willing to learn. When we stop learning, we're in trouble. We start going downhill when we start, stop learning and being willing to learn new information. Especially in today's age, new information is developing by the snap of my fingers right now. Quick, and it's going faster and faster and faster. So it's important that we have a growth mindset that says, you know what, I can be adaptable for this change. I'm gonna learn this. I'm gonna be on top of this so that I don't get, because you know what, you're either gonna be willing to change or you're gonna have to change. <laughs> and it's dangerous when we have to change. But when I'm willing to learn, then I can be on top of this. I may not agree how the systems work all the time, but I can master this and use this for the good, so why don't we learn how to leverage this and promote the gospel of the kingdom of God with it? Y'all, y'all hearing me this morning. I gotta have a mindset that is willing to grow, that's willing to become better. And this is the thing, I have the power you have the power to set your mindset. And a lot of that is based off of the information and the, the, the people that you surround you, the, the situations you surround yourself with, the, in, the information, the influences that you have in your life. What are we allowing to influence us? What do we listen to? Are you listening to podcasts that are going to edify you and encourage you and, and, and make you think? I'm a big audiobook reader. I like to read because that's somebody's brain listening. I'm listening to somebody's brain. I can take it on the grow. Are you reading books? Who's the people that you're hanging around? I could tell, there's a quote that says, I could tell the person you're going to be in the next five years by the people you're around and the books that you read. You're going to hang around broke, you're going to be broke. You're going to hang around stupid, you're going to be stupid. That's even biblical. You know, the, the wise hang around the wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. The Bible calls people fools. You dumb for hanging? You, you ever felt dumber by hanging around dumb people? But the opposite is true. I just feel smarter when I hang around smart people. So what is influencing our lives? I love the quote that James Allen says in his book, As a Man Thinketh. He says, a man... Man's mind can be like, likened to a garden, which may be intelligently cultivated or allowed to run wild. But whether cultivated or neglected, it must and will bring forth. If no useful seeds will fall therein and will continue to produce their kind. Did you know that you are always going to produce something? You are always going to produce something. You're always sowing the seed to something. And is that seed a, a seed that produces abundance in life where there's no lacking? Or is it bringing scarcity? Is it bringing poverty? You're going to produce something. What are we putting into the software of our mind? What, are, what information are we taking in? As believers, we are supposed to live in abundance. I'll say it again. As believers, 
If Christ is your Lord and you got the Holy Spirit inside of you, you are meant, you are designed, you are supposed to. It is God's will for you to live in abundance. John 10, chapter 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you may have life, and the Amplified says, in abundance to the full till it overflows. So God don't want you being broke in any area of life. See, broke is not just finances. Broke is relationships. Broke is in your health. Broke is in all these different areas of your life. John says, I pray that you prosper even as your soul prospers in all areas and that you're in good health. Right? So all, I'm supposed to prosper in my marriage. I'm supposed to prosper as a parent. I'm supposed, my family's supposed to prosper. There ain't supposed to be nothing lacking in my house. If there's lack, I'm missing it somewhere. Where do I need to renew my mind? I can't blame mama, I can't blame daddy, I can't blame the government, I can't blame the system, I can only blame me if it's continuing to happen in my life. Oh, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen this morning. It's my mindset, it's not the system. Oh, ouch, hallelujah. I'm not saying the systems are right, you know, man-made systems, I get that. Man made the system based off of our fallen nature. We made a system. But we're not supposed to go to the patterns of this world. We're supposed to be transformed by the entire renewing of our what? So if you want change, God changes you first. He changes how you see it. He changes your perspective. He changes your mindset your mindset we got to have a mindset of abundance so it's time to adopt an abundant mindset now so we can recognize how crucial it is to break through the mold in order to make room for fresh growth in our lives see to change our perspective or our mindset we need to focus on how Christ is revealed to us and discover the guiding principles and act in a way that makes us worthy of this prosperity. I'll say that again. That was good this morning. So if we're setting our mindset, you got to change your perspective. Change how you're seeing it. We need to focus on how Christ is revealed to us and to discover guiding principles and act in a way that makes us worthy of prosperity. But Paul says, act in a way that's worthy of your call. You gotta act like it. You gotta behave in a way that is worthy of you being in abundance. You gotta behave in a way that is worthy of that breakthrough you desire. You gotta change some habits. You gotta change some things around. You gotta get rid of that dirty mouth. You gotta get rid of that acting, that acting up. You gotta put off those things and put on Christ. Oh, come on. We, so many people, they don't want, you want change, but you don't want to change. You have to change. Don't, don't tell them to change if you ain't willing to do the work. Y'all, y'all, come, y'all here this morning. So to better understand how we can set our mindset to one of abundance, we're looking at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. If you're reading in context, it's 1 to 17. But here we see the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Colossae and specifically speaking to them about their life in Christ Jesus. Here we see the theme that Paul really highlights really through all of his, of his letters regarding their conduct as believers. And you see this theme where he's telling, you, telling them to put off and to put on. Put off and to put on. Here he says, put off your old man. You died to your old man. It's really describing what it means to be baptized in Christ. You're putting off the old man. You died to that old way of thinking. 
And he says to put on Christ, your new nature, right? In Romans, we like to say be transformed by the renewing of the mind all the time. But he says before that in Romans chapter one, he says to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. So in other words, when you sacrifice, you got to be willing to die to some things. You can't live the resurrected life without, without putting off the old life that was fashioned after the world, after the sinful, I should explain that, after the sinful nature of man. We were born into a sinful nature that missed the mark, right? A sinful nature that fell short of the glory of God. You're born into that. And it's not God's will that we remain in that mindset in that state of mind. He wants you to be above and above and not beneath. He wants you to be the head and not the tail. He wants you to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. But we have to deal with our mindset. We can quote that all the time, but if we're not willing to deal with our own mindset, you'll never be the overcomer. You won't, you won't overcome nothing. You're gonna flee when fate, when obstacles face. It's easy to revert back to your old flesh if you don't die to it. It's easy to, to revert back to your old way of thinking if you don't put it under and die to that so that now we can resurrect in the new man in Christ Jesus. So we have to put off in order to put on. You, you're not wearing, I hope that you're not wearing yesterday's clothes today. <laughs> Sometimes it happens. But if you want to go to the next level, even biblically speaking, you have to change your clothes. Come on. You got to change the clothes. When Joseph went to Potiphar's house, when he went to, to, when, when he went to be with the king, he had to change his garments. He couldn't bring the garments that was for the prisoner. He had to change his garments. Some of us need to change our garments because you're going to dress where you're going to go. You got to dress for success. You got to dress where you want to go in life. You got to act like you want to be there. You got to act like you deserve to be in the room because God's about to put you in some rooms that no man could ever put you in. But God's about to put you in some rooms. He's about to prosper you. He's about to put you in a room with people you never thought you would meet, but God made a way when it doesn't seem to be no way. A lot of times, it's the rooms that you're in. What room, that's another message. What room are you in? Tell your neighbor, say, what room are you in? What room are you in? God's preparing a table for you. He's opened up doors for you. He has a seat for you in, high, in mighty places. But are you prepared for it? Amen. So we see this concept of putting off and putting on. And we got to do that in regards to our, our, our mindset. And, but, but the first thing that we see here in Colossians is in order to adapt the mindset of abundance and change our mindset, we have to set our mindset and we have to shift our perspective. Colossians 3, 1 to 2 says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. So by the fact that he says there's things that is above, to me that says there's things that are below. If there's an above, there's a below. And many of us have been trained to think in a way that is below our privilege. You're, that is below what God has, has destined for us. That is below what you, and we've been, we're body, buying into what somebody else told us. A mindset that's been passed down from mama, from grandma, grandpa, from somebody else because they didn't make it. Because they, 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 they failed at this. They said you would never become this. Even in our communities, we place mindsets on people. I remember one time, and I, and I love them when I say this. They said, we were on a trip and they said, you know what, you must be a basketball player. You know this is true. 
I think we were in, in Atlanta. We were, they said, you must be a basketball player. I said, no, I'm not a basketball player. Then that person said, well, you missed your calling. I said, are you sure about that? Thank God, I, you know, I was already secure in who I am. Right? I said, it took me to come to the end of my basketball career for me to really realize what I was born to do. I had to die to the old, wet, the old way of thinking. But see, so many young kids are placed with that expectation on their life, and they can only think that they can only make it out by dribbling a ball or rapping a lyric or going towards, you know, a th certain gang or, so, or so, so forth, right? And we put that on them. And they don't see the potential and what they can really be interested in and what their calling really is. You may be called to be a businessman and be bad at it. You may be called to be a preacher. You may be called to, to do great things. And actually, a lot of athletes have to figure that out after they're done with sports anyhow. Because your life doesn't end after you retire. You only, they can only play for maybe a good 20 years. And then they have to rediscover themselves once that is done, because it does come to an end. <laughs> it does come to an end. So they have to figure, figure that out. What are you passionate about? What is all this? And it's really, it, it really takes them to get some counseling and get some totally mindset renewal, because that's all we've known. Because that mindset and perspective says, this is what you're meant to be. But you know what? God has a calling for your life. And we've got to shift our perspective. And it's by shifting it from the world to Christ. We have to shift our mindset. We've got to stop thinking so lowly of ourselves. We have to stop thinking below our standard. I said, God has a standard for you. He wants you to live. He wants you to live your best life. But in order for that to happen, I got to stop thinking so low and shift my eyes, shift my perspective to things above. Shift it to things above. So what does it mean to shift something? We, you change how you're seeing it. Like I said, our perspective is how we see and understand the world, and, our, and it's shaped even subconsciously how we engage with the world. Our behaviors, our, our decision-making is based on how you see it. Subconsciously. We could be making decisions subconsciously and not even knowing that we're making these decisions. That's how your subconscious works. Most of our decisions that we're making is subconscious decisions, not necessarily intentional decisions. You made it without even, without even thinking about making that decision. You, I don't know if you really planned out and thought about what we're wearing this morning. Some people just put clothes on, right? Some people, some people just choose to go the same route all the time, and it's just the same thing all the time. It's the same thing. It's in your subconscious mind. But we got to change how we do that. So now we have to shift our perspective. And he says to shift it to Christ. To shift it to Christ. Now, most of the time when we think about Christ, you're thinking about just Jesus, the, the, the anointed one. But actually, the word for Christ means anointing. It means anointing. Now, Jesus was the anointed one because he possessed the Holy Spirit inside of him. He possessed the thing that we lost in the garden. When we, when we were in, man was in the garden, Adam initially was walking in the anointing. He was walking in the anointing. That anointing is the thing that empowers you to do what God's called you to do. I, there's an old saying that the anointing is the burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. That anointing. You were created, we were created to live in the anointing. We were created to live in the anointing, and it's the Holy Spirit that causes us to live in that anointing. 
that empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's why when I think about Acts chapter 2, they had to wait to the coming of the Holy Spirit in order to go and do what they had to do. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon them and then empower them to do what they were meant to do. We, were, we are meant to live in the anointing and live in the calling that God has, has for us. But we have to shift our perspective and stop thinking so earthly bound that we're no heavenly good. So, some people say, don't be so heavenly good that you're no earthly, no heavenly bound that you're no earthly good. But I think the opposite is true too. Don't be so earthly good that you're not heavenly bound. We're supposed to be both. I said, we're supposed to be both. I'm supposed to be walking in the spirit. I'm supposed to be walking in my anointing. I know that when I'm doing that, I can lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. I know that I can stomp on the heads of serpents and it will, not, it will not harm me when I'm in my anointing. When I'm anointed. God desires for us to get back into that state of being anointed. That's when we can be fruitful, multiply, rule, and subdue. Now you can say, okay, what about these other people? Well, they found something that they found in their calling, even if they're not believers or not. They're prospering in the area because the principles are true for the just and the unjust alike. Right? So they, they figured that out, but there's still other places in their life where they're lacking. When you're in anointing, we're living in abundance. Things are happening. We're health, we're in our health, we're in our anointing. I think we need to get back to that old school teaching of the anointing. What does it mean to be in the anointing and be filled with the Holy Ghost and the power of the Holy Ghost? You want to do all these other things, but you're not including the Holy Spirit in those things. So you're, you have a form of godliness, but you don't have no power. I want the power of the Holy Ghost flowing in me. I want the Holy Ghost flowing in me. Amen. I want things. I want wherever my hand touches to prosper in Jesus' name. I want wherever my feet tread to be my territory. But in order for that to happen, I got to shift my perspective. I got to shift out and I got to focus it on Christ. I was meant to live in Christ. When we're born again and we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we are now in Christ. We're in Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit that identifies you as a son and daughter of God. We got to be in Christ, walking in that anointing but I got to shift what I'm looking at. That's why he gives us his word so that we could shift what we're looking at and we could see Jesus as our moral example and how he conducted his life. This is not what he did. It's how he conducted his life, how he did business. We ask all the time, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, look in your Bible. You'll figure it out. How he was kind to people, how he went to the prostitute's house and how he how he engaged with them, how he how he his mannerisms, how he gained favor with God and man. We got to shift our perspective. We got to change our, our perspective. A lot of our problems we have is not the problem. It's a perspective problem. So we have to change our perspective. How can I change this? New information. Be transformed by the entire renewing of your mind according to this word of God. He says, you, even to Joshua, you want to be successful? Meditate on this book of the law day and night. Day and night. Meditate on this book of the law. Think it over. Rehearse it over and over and over that you may, be, that you may make your way, what? Prosperous. So we got to change our, 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 our ways of thinking and shift it from earthly to heavenly. See, what the, the default, by default, we are conditioned by the world, which has lost its vision. I love what Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, people perish. But he who keeps the law, which includes that of man, blessed and happy and fortunate and enviable is he. You got to have a vision. 
Satan has clouded man's mind that they can't see. It's clouded how we see things. we got to have a vision. I love what Helen Keller once says. She said, the only thing worse than having, not having sight is having sight but no vision. you got to have a vision. See, what a vi- what, when we don't have a vision, you don't have direction in your life. You don't know where to go. you got to have a vision in it for your life. When you don't have vision, you lack motivation. You don't, want, you don't know what to get up in the morning for. Oh, so how you doing, Doug? I'm doing all right. Same old day, same old, same old. That's no vision. When you have vision, you get excited about what you're getting, to do, getting up to do in the morning because I'm going somewhere. You want to be a leader? You better be have a person with a vision because you, if you don't know where you're going, then you ain't going to get nowhere. It's the blind leading the blind. And we got a lot of blind leaders today just leading the blind. You got to have a vision. If you don't have a vision, you're going to stay, you're going to remain or turn back to the place that you were before. You'll be the same way, way next year as you were this year. And you repeat it because there's no vision. We got to have a vision, a redemptive revelation of God in our life. And then there is a vision for your finances and then there's a vision for your your career. God gives you that vision so that now we have a direction and we can go somewhere with this. You lose motivation. You you have ineffective decision-making skills when there's no vision. We have difficulty in alignment. A vision helps align individuals or teams towards a common goal. We got to have a vision. You're drifting off when there's no vision. Have you ever wondered where, like, where is that person? You look at them like, where have you gone? They're drifting off. They lose attention because there's no vision. They become stagnant. And there's difficulty in inspiring others. Leaders inspire other people. But we have to, if we want to be a leader and be who God created us to be and be in abundance, we need vision. Where there's no vision, my people cast off restraint. There's disorder. We don't get anywhere. It's, it, it digresses when there's not a vision. We got to have this vision. So shifting our perspective from the earth where there is no vision, where Satan has clouded the hearts and minds of men to shifting unto Christ, where now you can see. I said, now when you shift to Christ, now you can see. Oh, that's why he says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, he says, be transformed by the entire renewing of your mind that you may see. I have had sight, but I had no vision. When you get shift your mind to Christ, he gives you vision. And now you can see the good and perfect will of the Father. Am I preaching this morning? Is this good stuff? So shifting it to Christ, off of the world, to Christ. And when we're shifting that to Christ, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's empowered you to do what he's called you to do. So now we have a moral example, but now we discover guiding principles and values real quickly. It says this in, Col- in Colossians 3, 3, 12 to 17. Therefore, as the elect, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, you must also do. Amen. Amen. But of all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Oh, I like that. Love is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the Lord of Christ dwell in you richly. Amen. And teaching and admonishing one another 
speaking to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So when we're focusing on Christ, we discover principles and core values. Now, values is what you hold to be dear. Principles are what guide, help guide your life and your decision making. If you want to have any type of leadership, if you want to be any type of impact, you got to have good values and principles. Because how many know that those values and principles create a culture? They create a culture that surrounds you. And if we keep on with that bad talking, that malice, that hatred, that envy, it sets a culture. People don't like being around you because of the culture that you have set. So we got to value walking in love with people. He gives us a a couple things to value. He says kindness. Can you be kind to people? In other words, be nice. And this is how you know how, how, how you're filled with the Spirit. You can be kind to people because kindness is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. It is, a, it is a fruit that you bear. You know people by their what? Fruit. So if we're not bearing kindness and you say that you love God, well, the, the fruit of the Spirit is not, walking, is not working in you if I can't treat other people with kindness. If I, I have to put off that malice, I got to deal with that old man. I know that used to make me angry, but you know what? I can't give into the flesh. I have to submit and yield to the spirit of God inside of me. If I want to be in abundance, if I want to have overflow in my life, I got to watch how I'm treating people. I got to watch how I'm being kind to people. How are you even communicating to them? Are you building people up or are you tearing them down? Nobody wants to be chastised all the time. It got quiet in this house. Nobody wants to be yelled at all, all, all the time. Why do you think they would come and want, and want to work for you if you're just doing that all the time? No, we are, we are to edify. We're to speak to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. They should not leave your presence being depleted. Is people leaving your presence feeling more drained than empowered? That's a sign of a toxic person. If you have if you're in their presence and you feel depleted. There's toxic leaders, there's toxic preachers, there's toxic, toxic pastors, there's toxic employers because they're carrying around this bitterness and envy and how they, were, how they used to do things and they're not willing to shift their perspective and change it. It got good here. He says, put on kindness. Put on tender mercies. You got to watch how you're treating people. Meekness, long suffering. You got to learn how to bear with people. If there's one difficult thing I ought to do is how to deal with people. But we're to bear with one another in love. So you got to put up with me and I got to put up with you. Amen. Because I love you, I want to bear with you, and I want the best out of you. I want to encourage you. I want to love you back to life. You were down and out, but I want to love you back to life because there's potential that's on the other side of this. You can still make it out, baby. You can make it. You can make it, but you ha- I got to love you through it. I got to put on love. And he says, above all this, put on love. Put on love. Love is the greatest commandment. Love is the greatest commandment. I, I, you know, I was with, we were in Detroit last, last week, and I was with uh, Pastor Mormon and Dr. Bayard Bernard last week, and we were talking, and I said, I said, when we get to heaven, I want, I want to figure this out. We're going to see this. We're going to look down, and we say, it wasn't that hard. It wasn't that hard. We made it hard. 
because we were focused on the wrong thing. The one commandment is love. The one commandment is how we're supposed to love one another. All the other commandments, all the other 600 commandments is based off of this one simple but complex for us commandment. Can you love them? Can you love them as Christ loved you? That's the one thing that God is looking for. And a lot of people are missing the point because we're, we're focused on the wrong thing. If we could just learn how to love people and treat people with kindness and, and bear with one another and support one another, we, the church, can be the example for the rest of the world. We can be the example for the rest of the world. So we gotta have these guiding principles and core values, and then finally, we gotta act like it. We got to obey that, behave in a way that resembles Christ. How is your behavior? Your behavior is based on your mindset. If you're behaving wrongly, your mindset is off. Your perspective is off. How is our behavior? How are we making decisions? How are we treating people? How are we conducting ourselves? Your conduct matters. I said your conduct matters. Especially as a believer, we're held to a higher account. Your conduct matters. And I think it's time to take that seriously. How are we conducting ourselves? Ethically, how are you even conducting yourself? Are you conducting yourself in a way that, res that resembles Christ? Would God be pleased with this? When you look back on your life, will you be pleased with the decisions you're going to make? How are we conducting ourselves? We got to act it out. We have to put this to practice and, and, and act this out and conduct ourselves in a way that is worthy of our call. Did you receive something today? I think we can do it. I know we can do it. We can, we can live in abundance, but we have to change our mindset. I gotta change my, my conduct. This, the way I used to conduct myself, that got, that's what got you here. For some people, you know, you might have had some, some success in, in that. But when it's halting, when it's not growing, when it's not prospering, I gotta change some things. How I used to do things doesn't work now in this new season. It doesn't work. I got to change my conduct. I can't treat so and so like they used to, like they, they used to. This young generation, you treat them like that, they out. Period. Because you ain't gonna sit there and talk to them any kind of way. If they don't see how they can grow under your leadership, why should they be there? Time to consider, do as Haggai says and consider our ways. Right? We got to change our conduct. If we want to make progress, I got to change my mindset, shift my perspective, and change my conduct. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word today, Father. Help us. We can't do this without the help, your help, Lord. Help us change our mindset. Help us be renewed by our, the entire renewing of our mind. Help us change how we have treated people. We repent if we have treated people wrong. If we have hurt people because we were hurt. I thank you, Father, that you are in the room right now to heal. I pray for anybody that has been hurt in this place. Whether that's been at work, whether that's been in church, wherever it has been. Lord, help us. Help us heal, but help us change how we've done it. Because we want to resemble you. We want to resemble Christ in Jesus' name. How many agree with that? Amen. Amen. Come on, give God a praise.
You're going to make it. But we got to change our mindset. We're going to live in abundance. We will have growth this year. I see people's businesses scaling, healthy relationships going up, marriages being restored because we're changing our mindset. God bless you guys. May God bless you, keep you, and make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. Be blessed.